Hello people, it's uh, Zach here again today. And um, as mentioned in my last video, I'm going to be focusing today on uh, being in time. Now, um, when most people think of time, we think about linear progressions of events. Um, and, and what do we mean by that? Like, um, well, w one way of interpreting this is this idea of action and reaction. Um, and most of the time when we're thinking of time, we're thinking of reaction. We're saying that everything has a cause and effect. Um, every event has a cause and effect. Uh, but if you take this to its logical conclusion, if you, if you take it to the limit, what you find is that we can't actually explain the origins of natures by this, by this law because we end up having to have an uncaused cause. There is an exception to nature that must exist in order to explain how, how this law can even exist. Um, and this is actually going to be the intro to my next video uh, talking about um, a logical proof of the afterlife and uh, the inner reality. Um, because the inner reality doesn't abide by nature, it abides by something that's nature adjacent, which I call spirit, but um, the unnatural natural. But anyway, um, talking about um, the, uh, the idea of causality and uh, linear progressions of events is that Causality is not precedence. Causality is dependence. If one person walks into a room and then immediately afterward another person walks into the room, uh, the second person walking into the room is not dependent on the first person walking into the room. There, there was a precedence there, but there is not a dependence. And so when we realize that causality is not precedence, which we also realize is that not all dependence is dependence upon actual past. Um, now that's the one we tend to focus the most on, uh, because that's the kind that's deterministic. Um, that's what we know is, is absolutely true. Um, there's also this idea, though, that if you're not reacting, you're acting. Um, those are opposites of each other. Of course, they differ in different in, in degrees. Um, something can be acting more than it's reacting, or reacting more than it's acting. Um, but when we're talking about acting, I mean, what, what drives things to act the ways that they do? And my particular theory on this is that things are, when they're acting, they're becoming. They're seeking out a particular state um, that they want to be in. Um, they are trying to be um, rather than become. Um, but anyway, um, the, well, I guess an example of this would be like, uh, say for example, um, that... I plan on going to the store today to buy bread, all right? Well, the that is a potential future that today I will go and buy bread at the store. Um, but it's, it's not guaranteed to happen. I mean, I might, something might come up in, be, in the meantime, and it would stop me from going to the store. Something, like I might go to the store and they might be out of bread, or they might be shut down, or I might get into a car accident. Um, who knows what could happen in between the time that I plan on going to the store and uh, when it actually unfolded. And this, this links to this problem in the science of uh, determinism. Um, now, all of the calculations in science are based just on, on this idea that all processes are reversible, that they work the same going forwards in time and backwards in time. And there's also this belief that everything that happens in the universe is deterministic. But the problem is that when you're talking about potential futures, you're always sacrificing dimensions of space and time in order to do it. Any calculation you're going to do is going to be at a lower resolution than reality itself. And, um, and, and what do I mean by this? Uh, well, let's say, for example, that you have a trebuchet and you're trying to uh, launch a ball across a yard. Now, you can predict um, with your mathematics exactly how much force that this trebuchet is going to launch this with. Um, and you, you know the exact trajectory and you know exactly where it's going to hit. And then this, but the second you press that button, the wind starts blowing and it pushes your ball off course and now it's somewhere else. And you're saying, well, that doesn't work because um, we, you know, we didn't factor those variables into our experiment. If, they, if, they, if we had controlled the variables, we would have known what happened. Well, yeah, but that, that's, that defeats the problem with what I'm talking about, which is that you are sacrificing information about the environment in order to focus on one particular thing that you want to be determinable. Um, to... If, if you wanted to be that absolutely certain of where that ball had landed, you would have to predict that the wind was going to blow at that time. And I, I'm not sure if you've noticed, but we're not that good at predicting weather. 
um, when we basically have to have supercomputers to do this stuff, and even then we can only do it with like 60 to 70 percent accuracy because you're talking about a chaotic system where even just the smallest change in its input results in immense changes in its output. Um, you know, the old uh, euphemism of like a butterfly flaps its wings and a uh, hurricane hits the coast of Africa. But anyway, um, so let's say that you could, um, let's just say that you could simulate all of that. Like you had um, a supercomputer that was infinitely smart and can um, do all of these calculations in real time. Um, now you now you still run into the problem that in order to make the prediction of where the ball is going to be, um, you have to do it faster than the universe itself can simulate that. And that's not possible. You can't simulate within a simulation uh, faster than what you what is simulating the simulation. Um, so it's physically impossible. And this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying that you're sacrificing dimensions of time. The calculation that you're performing is going to take longer than it would take for the universe itself to perform that calculation. Um, so anything that we're going to predict uh, in regards to the future is going to be non-deterministic. Um, there we are always it's always going to exist in probabilities because we're always sacrificing dimensions of space and time we can't control everything and we can't um, identify all of the variables um, and so um, when, when we realize this um, now we, we start leading into this idea of the Janus point and the um, the Janus point was um, is it's not a term that I invented. It's actually a term I found um, from a talk on uh, YouTube made by a certain professor. Um, he's, he's actually basing uh, an entire model of physics upon this idea. And uh, the Janus point is this idea that the there is this there is only the now, um, and then the the past and the present are adjacent to the now. Um, and I, I don't really um, like this um, thinking about this in terms of present, past, and future. The way I like thinking about it is more of like is the now, uh, the knowable and the unknowable, or the the now, the known, and the unknown. Um, now, when we're talking about this as well, um, there's there's another peculiar problem that we we notice that there are things that we can't see. Um, Well, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this because it's a very complicated topic to get into. Um, you, you know, the humans can only view like a particular um, band of, of the electromagnetic spectrum, what we call the visible spectrum. And uh, things that are outside of this band are invisible to us. Um, and, and an interesting fact is that everything that's in the universe is constantly vibrating unless it's at a temperature of absolute zero, which is basically impossible. And so if everything is vibrating, that means it's also creating electromagnetic field perturbations. And what this means is that everything in the entire universe is glowing. Um, humans, uh, in particular, are actually glowing in the infrared range, but we can't perceive that glowing. Um, and, and, there, and there's other interesting things as well. Like, take for example, the infrared can penetrate um, plastic that's completely opaque. Um, so something that's opaque to us um, ends up being transparent to something else. Or like, um, glass is one of those cases where, like, I don't, I don't think that infrared actually penetrates uh, glass. It's actually completely opaque to the glass. Um, so something that's transparent to us ends up being opaque to something else, and. There's um, also this uh, idea of like um, of of standing waves that if um, if you're familiar with a standing wave, the standing wave, the the peaks and the troughs, they actually stay near each other. Um, things that sit inside the peaks and the troughs, like they they always stay in the same area, like um, lengthwise as the as the vibration is happening, um, and so. There, there's this problem like anything that's going to be in between any of the of the of the curves that are on a standing wave are going to be incapable of perceiving each other, and uh, so what, what I'm basically trying to get at here is that anything that it is being there are things that it can perceive and then there are things that are can't that it can't perceive, and this is based off of uh, systems of um, of uh, of harmonics and also upon. Um, uh, resonance and, and it just in it, it, it like I said it's a complicated topic to get into 
Um, but one of the ways that I like to think about this as well is that there's, you can also almost think about this as an awareness of consciousness of things. Like you are not aware of every single thing in the entire universe. Um, and that's because the, the things that, um, affect you most are so close to you that by the time the information that is beyond that gets to you, it's so much weaker that it's almost nothing but background noise. Even though the information does actually get to you, like we, we still get information, um, like cosmic background radiation or um, light from stars that are have um, blown out billions of years ago, and that was something that was um, beyond our perception. Like we did not know what the stars were like like three billion years ago, but now we do, and so that was beyond what we could perceive in in, in terms of consciousness. Um, and so there's this idea that um, I developed um, in talking about being of uh, everything that exists has a particular realm of things that it's conscious of, um, its own realm of consciousness, things that exist um, within its reality, um, but perhaps not in the existence of others. And this doesn't mean, I don't mean this in like in the sense that everything exists in its own dimension. Um, I'm literally just saying that what things can perceive is, is limited. And so, um, this actually leads into another interesting thing as well, the idea of dark energy. Um, this energy that doesn't appear to interact at all with the electromagnetic spectrum, but yet seems to re-interact with gravity. And, um, now, one of the particular problems that I, I've always had with uh, dark energy is that uh, is in an, I, I, identifying it. Because how do you know the difference between a problem with your own calculation and whether or not something is actually there? But uh, aside from that point, if we were to humor the idea that there is actually something in there and it's not just a problem with the calculations, um, what it means is that it's possible for two things to be able to intersect in space at the same time and have no effect on each other. Like, um, because they exist in entirely different realms, and and I don't mean this in like in dimensions. Well, you could think of it as dimensions, but um, I'm just meaning that they're incapable of being conscious of each other because of a particular state that they exist within. Um, but you know, like I said, I mean, we have evidence of this already. If, if you want to take it as that through like dark energy and dark matter, um, so it's not an entirely radical idea. But anyway, these are these are just all my thoughts that I've I've had on uh, on time and on um, the nature of, of being in time and on and on determinism and things and uh, just a, a lot for you for you just to, to sit and ponder about for a bit. Um, and, and one of the things that I really like about this is um, about thinking about the world this way and about the future being non-deterministic because because it means that we do actually have free will. Um, because we exist within the now and the future is it's a suggestion is what it is it's, it's potential it's not actual um but anyway um thanks for watching and then the next video like i like i said i'm going to be um on i think on gab and minds um the next video i'm going to be doing is going to be on the afterlife and the inner reality um so uh, stay tuned and uh, thanks for watching